So welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us today for the Tinker Code Make session and how we can excite creative learning with Generation Z and to really excite these students with being creators of their futures. So I'm gonna put this in full screen so that you'll have that opportunity to get more screen real estate, as I always say, because in this case, the larger presentation is the better so that you can see it. Please feel free to continue the conversation in the back channel chat. I will have some questions for you to making sure that your learning is interactive and it's more than just a set and get, because I wanna make sure that you, you gain meaningful experiences that you can represent and actually implement tomorrow in your classroom, whether it's online, blended, or eventually face-to-face. -face. Some of you already know me, and some of you, you've been coming back to our sessions, and I absolutely love the connections that we've been making. My name is Naomi Harm. I'm originally from the Midwest, had lived there for almost 45 years, and for the last five years or so, I've been out on the West Coast. I have had um, wonderful learning opportunities to help lead the education strategist team for Dell EMC and Wonder Workshop with coding and robotics in California. And now I've landed in beautiful Arizona where I can start back up my women in leadership team. And I do a lot for the Q conference and Microsoft to share best practices with everything related to STEM innovation. So I want to know who all of you that have joined us today. Many of you I've seen before or we've chatted, but please share with me in the back channel chat, which gives you that little black ribbon bar and where it has like a little card or a little call out, click on that area and that will provide for you an area to share who you are, what your creative job role or influence you provide, whether it's to students or teachers, and why and what is your purpose why you have chosen to join us today. I'd love to learn with you on that. I have another device online as well today, so I'll be monitoring our back channel chat so that I can see each and every one of you. So I can make sure too that I do not miss any of your questions that you're um, so kind to share. Okay. So take a moment just to please share who you are, your creative job role and influence you provide, and then why you've decided to join us today. Oh, Marilyn, welcome. So glad you're here with us. So I'm just monitoring the back channel chat to see who is all here with us. Please share your creative job role or even in which part of the world you're joining us from. We have teachers from all over the globe, which is absolutely amazing. That's what I love about this, because we can really share creative strategies that we may not have thought of or even had that experience at other parts of our world that teachers are using that are quite successful. Okay, I'm just looking ahead and what I'm seeing right now, we've got a teacher that uh, Crystal is greeting us. She says aloha. She teaches second grade in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've got Jim joining us from Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome, welcome. And, and also as an NCCE trainer, looking to improve training skills and influence. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Julie, welcome. STEM coordinator from Orange County Department of Ed. All right, Lori, you're back with us. Uh, K through five maker spaces for four years. Wow. That is like the perfect job, isn't it? It's constantly learning, but it's so much fun to work with the kids. Diana, welcome. I'm so glad you're here from Texas, from elementary as well. Another great teacher friend, Julie from Orange County Department of Ed. Glad that you're with us. And also Karen, fourth grade teacher from Illinois. Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. Just getting through to see who else is with us in case I missed any of you. Okay, wonderful. So welcome everyone, so glad that you are with us today and your background experience. So I will have something for everybody because we're gonna have a K through 12 um, influence of best practices of where we're at at this time. Okay, let's get back um, to our learning of where we're at and let's look at some other pieces of possibility of what we can provide for you that can influence your students and teachers that you work with.
I want to give a little background information, and I normally do in most of my presentations, about the students that you're currently working with and even some of your millennial teachers. But we want to talk about uh, the students that are our Generation Z population. And those are our teachers from 1995, or I'm sorry, our students that are born between 1995 and 2012. That is reflective that our students have entered the job market or job force at this time already, have just completed some college or certifications, but yet there are our students that are in our grade levels from upper third, fourth, fifth, and so on through high school. We're gonna talk a little bit about Generation Alpha, and Alpha means that these students are going to be the continued leaders of the pack, and they are our kiddos that are born from 2012 and will be continually born until about 2030. Now, what we know about our kids, especially that are really engrossed in STEM projects and maker spaces, in our schools right now is that they are really an entrepreneurial generation. An entrepreneurial meaning that they do want to start their own business someday. They want to create and make, and they really do socially collaborate. They really enjoy with kids as dynamic duos or trios. But sometimes when kids get in too large of groups, it becomes too overwhelming. So kids like to work in actually quite diverse small groups is what we're finding. The other things that we also find from this group, especially at middle school and high school, is that they are the most diverse generation to date on our planet. They are less tied to parental advice or even sometimes to our advice as teachers. So we need to find creative ties of understanding what influences them, how we can bring credible experts in to influence and guide their background foundational skills and their knowledge, but to also role model what we can do to influence for them to pursue a passion-driven career that they may not have thought of. The big piece of information that I find most interesting about these kiddos is that they value their peers' opinions more than us. And I mentioned that earlier. Their attention spans are so tiny. They're like eight seconds, they say. And eight seconds meaning once they've been exposed to something new, they know initially within eight seconds, do they like it? Do they find it exciting? Or do they think, uh-oh, this is part of the same old, same old, I'm not interested, and may tune you out. So for us as educators, as we influence students and teachers of this realm as well, we need to make the most insightful and impactful learning anticipatory set in that first five minutes of their learning so that you can hook them and have them for the next hour. But these kids, what I find interesting is they really demand transparency. They wanna be part of the bigger conversation and they want the learning to continuously happen and they want to have their voice and input. Now, due to our time saving sake today, I have some embedded videos and, be, and due to sometimes the video playback, it gets a little chunky in here. So I'm just going to, I've added this into the slide deck so that you can watch this after the fact, but this gives you some interesting context about Generation Z, everything I've mentioned already, but another spin on it as well. But I wanna give you some background context as well about Generation Alpha students. They're known as the I generation. These kids are absolutely incredible. In this generation, I myself am now a grandparent. I have a six-year-old granddaughter, a three-year-old grandson, and a two-year-old granddaughter. And they've always had some type of device that they've already interacted with by the age of two. But we make sure as grandparents, but also my own sons and daughter-in-laws that we have, that we make sure that there's a time limit because we don't want to overdo it because we want to make sure that their brains develop properly. There's a balance of screen time, but yet what they are interacting with screen time will help connect the learning dots that are really important for foundational skills of math, literacy, science, and their world around them. Now, I also have another little brief video clip here, but this is for what Generation Alpha has to say about technology. And this is coming out, <clears throat> excuse me, and the support from the McCrindle Foundation. And this is out of the UK. And what's interesting is that these students have had exposure for already up to five or seven years. And their influence with technology, sometimes they can actually walk all over a teacher in a classroom because they're not afraid to touch the buttons, to play something that works, and also to try to figure it out without getting too frustrated. 
Now, this is my little granddaughter. This is Maddie Ann. She is six years old. She'll be seven in September. She has just finished her kindergarten remote teaching and learning practices with her teacher this last year, and they are continuing on um, as a blended model in Wisconsin moving forward until this pandemic can get under control some more and be safe. So because of that, what's interesting about this generation alpha of students is that they're entirely born within the 21st century. And they are the most technology infused and literate demographic generation up to date. Even though they are very tech savvy, they still need to be guided with influence from us as teachers with credible resources, the how to's and how to enhance their understanding when it comes to technology. They're not afraid to use anything, and that's when they pick up a device, they wanna to touch, tap, and interact with it. These kids will even go up to a large screen monitor or TV that is not touch interactive, and they wanna to touch it. And I find myself with my own laptop that's not touch interactive at times, that when I transition from my phone and I go to my laptop, I too want to touch it. It's just because it's that natural um, interface that we wanna interact with. But these students also are using more AI, artificial intelligence. What that means is that they're using voice technology to help solve some of their basically real world challenges as a toddler to an elementary school child. And what's so interesting about that is that they will ask like Google Home or Alexa or other types of chatbots questions to help solve their routines. So an example that my little granddaughter uses is that she was having a hard time when kindergarten started to get up early in the morning to get her routine down and to get on the little school bus to take her to where she needed to go. And she wanted to sleep in in the morning, actually. So we invested in a voice technology um, device in which that she could actually set the musical chime that would get her up by that 6, 630 in the morning. And then from there, it would set the routine to remind her to get up to have a healthy breakfast that they had planned the night before. Then she would go and brush her teeth and then making sure that she got her clothes on for the day. And then she would go to pick her backpack up that was also packed the night before to make sure that she gets on the bus in time that her mom and dad would guide her with. Now, without that technology, she sometimes was just a little grumpy pumpkin in the morning, and she was having a hard time following through some of those routines, or we call those executive functions for these little ones. But the more that we can empower to use their brain knowledge and even getting ready the night before physically, that uses less brain power in the morning and allows them more free time to have a more relaxed and energized morning. But at the same time, the voice technology helped her get through that morning successfully with an, basically an algorithm, a sequencing and logically um, uh, steps that would help her be successful and have a great um, gratitude filled morning for her day. Now, I wanna share with you a few other things about Generation Alpha that we need to plan for futuristically and especially those that you've told me that you are teaching maker spaces in your elementary classroom. And here's some other things to think about. These children, as I mentioned before, are the generation of millennial parents. And this is what's interesting. Robot surgeons are now in place and they can be more accurate than human surgeons. And millennial parents are now already approving robotic surgeons to do surgery on their children. And it's making the difference between life and death for many of them, especially when it comes to heart surgeries or if they need a modification for a limb and things like that. And they're actually trusting doctors who have the AI intelligence to make those life and death decisions because they're more accurate, it's more precise, and there's more research behind it that could actually run through the algorithm of the pros and the cons and the percentages of the data analytics. But what's so amazing with this is that this generation alpha of children are not gonna have to worry about their millennial parents when they retire because these are the students that are gonna develop the algorithms, the machine learning techniques, and the robotic applied interfaces to create 
mobile robotics in homes so parents do not have to go into nursing homes. They'll also have these robotics and types of AI technology that will be checking on parents for their health, their wellness, if they fall, if they need help, if they need assistance to come and get them, and to support the self-driving car initiative. So these are the kids that will be our alpha students, the leaders of the pack that are truly going to transform with AI technology. And the more types of AI experiences that we can afford our students, the more productive and efficient that we will be in our year to come and actually will help our world be a safer, greener, and sustainable place to live with and on. But I find it so interesting that if you'd like more information, there is a whole site on this. It's called AI Social Robots that will care for the elderly. So sometimes I think I'm 52 years old right now. In 10 years or 20 years, will this come into play already? And will I in my lifetime have an AI robotic that will help take care of me? Meaning that I can stay in my place so that I don't have to be or have to go to a type of nursing home that we have in the United States. Now, I just wanted to have you reflect on your back channel chat learning, but what was maybe one new idea that you just found interesting about Generation Z or Generation Alpha that you did not know about and why? So if you could reflect on that learning, that would help me with your understanding at this time. So what was one idea that you just found interesting about Generation Z or Generation Alpha that you did not know about and why, and that possibly could help you with your focus of your STEM um, innovation focus for the students or teachers you work with. As you do that, I'm going to bring up the back channel chat so that I can uh, preview and modify kind of where everybody's at. And welcome, um, uh, Jacqueline as well. I believe I mentioned you before. Thank you for joining us from San Diego. Uh, Cecilia, welcome. Mary, welcome. Uh, Marjorie, welcome as well. Um, I have here again, I'm going to add that shortened link that you can get the entire slide deck of today's back channel chat. But if you could just reflect on one or two learning components of what you've learned about Generation Z or Alpha and how it's going to help you as the STEM specialist or innovation specialist in your job. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Diana. Right, the new thing that you learned that to interact with ease when touching a screen. Also, the importance of a balanced interactions. Absolutely, and balance means we need appropriate brain-based balance because all this information becomes too much, even for us as educators, but just think about how it is for our students. So appropriate balance of even creative rotation stations that can be unplugged activities, choice of literature and rich literacy, um, opportunities for tech enhanced and then the applied robotics of the sensory modalities. Absolutely. Yeah, it says I find it interesting that um, they're not going to have to worry about their aging parents, even though it says although this does not apply to my job, but think about it futuristically. It's how we influence these children with the types of access and equity and learning experiences to build these lifelong learning confidences with these children. If we choose not to influence these children with the type of learning, then that children's really going to miss out. We need to make sure that they have a choice in that learning. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, the design thinking is probably a critical factor too. They need to solve for a problem. And the two Julies that are in here, they said a lot of their camps and styles that they do is you are designing for a creative solution that we never would have thought of. So the design thinking and the engineering design thinking process is imperative to all of this learning right now. So keep, keep up those reflections. We'd love to learn with you um, more strategies and ideas that you have. Okay. Let's continue on. Um, we also need to discover what are these Generation Z students truly passionate about? And when was the last time that you asked these students why and how and where they learn best? What are they truly interested in? Have we taken the moment or are we just assuming that we know what they need? We need to have more creative, creative conversations with our students and we need to create different design tasks and challenges that meet the needs of today's learners based on their interest. Now, what we really know too about this generation is that they are and want to be more independent, creative, and problem-solving thinkers. But 
with that type of message, they also want to collaborate and work in environments that they can socially meet with students, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. That's why it's really cool within Microsoft Teams or within Google Meet or with any of your other choice of online learning with like Zoom, you can have breakout rooms to blend that learning. So kids with really Java-like focuses or passion focuses can meet, greet, talk, and design together, and then come back as a large group to influence the others to share their discoveries. But I find it so fascinating with the high school students that I really talk with, they, they say about 72% right now that they want to start a business someday. And I think about in our STEM practices, are we affording our kids the opportunity of a STEM-driven career focus or a passion? And are we bringing in experts from the field to share their story of where they started out, the challenges they faced, the success stories that took them to even lead to a whole nother STEM career? So we need to afford our kids more opportunities to, to bring a STEM career focus in of different types of entrepreneurs, global corporations, whether it's technology, whether it's education, whether it's the healthcare industry, whether it's neuroscience. We need to afford our kids the possibilities that they can become anything they want to be, but they love to listen to stories to be impacted, to see that it does take hard work, it takes perseverance, it takes dedication, and sometimes even pursuing one path leads us to another path, to another path to end up where we lead. So here's the other thing. This is very interesting, and you probably have already seen this with your own children and the students that you influence. But 92% of Generation Z has a digital footprint. These students have been online since almost their birth because when they were born, most parents or guardians or grandparents received an actual birth ultrasound of basically their digital footprint and that's what it is parents then in return shared it out to grandparents to guardians to aunts and uncles and so on and all of a sudden their digital footprint became a reality but what's so amazing about this is that the blend of our students globally is the most diverse population on our earth and that's what makes us stronger together it's because of all these rich ethnicity groups coming together of the diversified learning experiences and their background knowledge that we can blend together to learn from each other's perspectives to help us to create these amazing solutions that we never would have thought of. And bringing these kids, groups of kids together now is going to help us solve for our world's greatest challenges, just like the pandemic that we're in right now, moving forward, that we don't have to relive this again, because these are the students of Gen Z and Gen Alpha that will solve for this that we will not have to repeat this in history again. The other thing that you've already probably know about this, and then we're gonna go into some STEM activities, but this group of Generation Z and Generation Alpha students are so global. They wanna make a social impact because even look at, look at our pandemic right now, they have created a multitude of different strategies of creating PPE for our healthcare industry, for our communities, for our nursing homes, for our friends and families. They have a generosity gene in their innate system. They really do. They want the goodness to prevail. They want to live in a world that's empathy field, empathy based, and they want to help others and they want to unite unite our country when at this time we can see there's so dis so much disruption between all of our unique populations. And that social cause is going to make us stronger and come together to build a greater world of good. So these Generation Z students truly love to tinker and make. They want to design. And some of you have already shared already that the creating and design challenges is really taking off well. And if we can get kids to think differently of how to design a solution moving forward to help our world be more um, empathy filled, compassionate, productive, efficient we are going to make greater gains to, again, be the global entrepreneur society that we should be to help everyone be successful. And again, everyone wants our world in general of every continent to be successful. So we need to unite and help these kids find their success and career paths that really resonate with them. So are there any other strategies at this time that you could identify and discover 
that your students are most interested in? What have you known with talking with your students or even you could say your millennial teachers or some of you may have first year generation Z teachers in your classrooms right now or in your schools? What are they identifying and discovering? What are most what are they most interested in? What are you finding that's even different from kids from five years ago? Because there's truly a different. Our kids that graduated five years ago have a different strength and strategy to compare to what our kids right now in the classrooms are focused on. So I'm going to take a peek in the back channel chat and see what you're typing about. Yes, Diana, that's right. All generations are learners no matter what, and they're very passionate about that. Absolutely. Yes, and it's also important, Julie, thank you for sharing that these kids in both generations are comfortable with the technology. So we as teachers need to ramp up our game plan. And, and I always recommend this, that less is more. It doesn't mean that we sit and teach for hours at a time online. Small snackable chunks of information are imperative right now. Meaning when I introduce new content of two or three slides, we should include then a slide of practice that allows kids to reflect, to draw, to create, and share their understanding. It also empowers these kids at this time to process and have think time. Too many times we as teachers move on and move ahead too quickly, and then we're leaving this greater majority of kids behind, and then they never catch up. And it could be determined because English is not their first language, it also could be based on the experiences of how they process information. It could be that may, they have a differing ability. So because of that, we need to slow down and then dive deeper into the content and really find out what they're passionate about. Absolutely. Social causes, yes, is imperative. And I love that you brought that up, Diana. Yes, uh, the United SDS, uh, the SDGs, which are our global goals of sustainability. And we need to focus on something bigger and better. And that's where we should be. So continue to share your information of your influence of your students about what they're interested in. Because I know talking with my little grandchildren, what they're passionate about, like Maddie, she's six years old, going to be seven. We just created her first Maddie's Makerspace YouTube channel. That's what she wanted. And she wants to teach the world about how to create slime and how to create maker projects that influence children. So because of that, uh, we can already see that she is going to be a social entrepreneur, but she wants to learn already with kids. And since she's home and she can't be with her classmates, she, wanna sh she wants to share the love of learning on live. Absolutely. Okay, let's continue on with a few more ideas for you um, that I've actually personally used. This is one of my favorite by far projects. I use this one especially for upper elementary, middle, and high school. And I'm actually using this one right now because I teach a grad course with education technology specialists out of New York that we have motivating girls to lean in to pursue passion-driven careers. And we use this particular tool from the Convergence Lab that is coming out of San Francisco, um, California. It's called a Passion to Purpose Project. This Passion to Purpose Project will empower you as a teacher to create your own passion and purpose project first and then model it for students. So you've basically identified your passion about what you're interested in. It can be personal or it can be professional. Then from there, you go through a series of about nine simple questions that generate design thinking questions to inspire yourself to solve a real world problem. It's absolutely brilliant and allows our kids and you as a teacher to think about the bigger objectives and the visionary leadership that we can provide for our kids. So again, this is called the Passion to Purpose Project. Another um, idea that I've used a lot when I role model and mentor girls, this is called from Sci Girls Connect. This was based on a PBS project out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. This was funded by a grant, and this is still extremely relevant, even though it just ended its term. This is still the site that's live. But when I showcase and share STEM educational careers to especially girls, girls want to see themselves of their ethnicity, of their origin, how they talk, how they speak. They want to see the similarities of young women that are out there that are influencers. So I bring in this, which is called the Sci Girls Connect, and it provides role model profiles of what women around the globe are doing. 
So what I find so interesting, I mean, this is an architectural estimator. Then we also have an environmental specialist. Then we also have a bat biologist. There's also a bicycle engineer in here. And who would have thought that you can have a job as a bicycle engineer? But this girl was so in tune to riding a bike as a child and then going out on mountain uh, road trips with her bike. And she is now um, designing for Trek and Canadel the main frames to make them the best that they can be for safety, durability, and for all types of users, and also with people with differing abilities, so it's truly accessible if you have some type of impairment. So again, SciGirls Connects is a great way to role model for boys and girls their future potentials of what they can be. Some other areas I wanted to share with you, this again is one of my favorites. This is also coming out of the Bay Area in California. This is called careervillage.org. This is where you as a teacher or a mentor can sign on to the site, add your students in, and then from there, have your students ask really inquisitive or inquiry-based questions about future careers, about learning gains, about questions, what it's like. What is it like to be an RN as a nurse in a healthcare situation during the time of COVID? You know, what is it like to be a neuroscientist that you are helping um, our army men and women recover from a traumatic brain injury or to help them live now a quality life because they have endured something uh, during their time in the war? Or what does it look like that I want to be the next 3D pastry chef? What types of courses should I be taking in computer science to ensure that I can open up my own successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur business as a 3D baker? So in particular, I actually do a lot of mentoring in here. And when a tag or a hashtag comes in on STEM or women leadership or careers, I get that in my inbox each morning. And then I can take that 15 minutes and fill my heart with gratitude with giving back to a larger community to help influence, to help role model, and to help mentor students with finding the right answers to help them to continue to pursue or to pursue a job of their career interest. So again, careervillage.org. It's a game changer. And I tell you, I've gotten some great feedback over the years that I've been using this where kids have pursued their dreams and they've gotten back and said, you know what, thank you for helping mentor me to guide me. And this is where I've landed now. Here's some other things that if you haven't seen, this is the 2030 student job tasks and market skills that I put together based on research that I did. Um, I provided a keynote to uh, Vancouver, British uh, Columbia in Canada in October. Uh, with the partnership with ISTE, and ISTE stands for the International Society for Tech and Education. I wanted to work with these two entities that we came up and did the research of what the job potential and what the market is seeing for job careers by 2030. I have 24 cards plus 24 descriptions of what the job possibilities are, and we're already seeing some of these hit the market already. Because we've seen some in the past, you know, of being a building engineer, but the building engineer now really looks at the data scientists be behind the building engineer. And what does it look to basically rewild your environment uh, for a particular area? when there's no more space to build? And what does it have to look like? One of these as the building engineer is a critical focus. Like I live in Cave Creek, Arizona, 40 miles north of Phoenix, but a town south of Phoenix is called Tempe, Arizona. They're building new community neighborhoods that will have no cars in them, meaning it is going to be a green sustainable community that you will walk or use your bike. And then when you get to the outskirts of your neighborhood, that's where you can pick up a Lyft or an Uber to get where you need to go. So we're thinking differently about how to build communities um, that can be more sustainable, that are more green friendly, that are better for our environment, and that actually bring community members together that are truly diversified and appreciate and respect the differences of others. So again, this is just a snapshot of the possibilities. I've got 24 cards. And I think moving forward, you also see it says career and life coach. We already see that there's a life coach 
purpose that's been happening for the last three years, but a career and life coach is going to be imperative for our future because our students will be not only honing their craft when they earn a degree, a certification, or a certificate of study, but their life will change about every five years that they have to improve their skill set to stay relevant. That means they may be changing jobs, they may be changing a career focus, or they may be enhancing that at the same time. So a career and life coach is imperative to balance all the technology with life and living a happy life that we're not so overwhelmed with the technology. Here's some other things if you haven't thought about. Instructables, oh my goodness. This is one of those that I clearly say is better than chocolate. There is an activity in here for every child of every ability. I love it because it's grade level focused. So I've got my K through two, my three through five, our six through eight, our nine through 12, and then our university levels of kiddos too. What's wonderful about this is that this provides access and equity to the just-in-time resources of unplugged activities, the maker generation. It includes everything from like Makey Makey to doing circuit, circuitry projects. It includes all kinds of applied robotics and STEM focuses. It focuses on green and sustainable projects of how to build our world and make it a better place for years to come for generations that we will never see. That's what I love about this. And then the beauty of it, kids can design and create their own projects and create their own tutorials and have them uploaded so students are teaching students as a peer coaching focus. It is absolutely brilliant. I use this particular portal um, that there is a, there's a focus in here just for a makey makey projects. So when you go to the top, when you go to instructables.com, you'll have a search field, just put in makey makey. Then you'll have a whole page of makey makey projects. So I taught a certification course for our teachers. And from that, as part of their certification, they created a step-by-step -step tutorial that they saw for a problem that they were having during the time of COVID already in their own homes. And then they launched those projects here online and they did a beautiful job and everyone was so creative. So enjoy this site again, 100% free. The other thing that if you don't know, there's all kinds of community-based projects along with contests in here. So designer challenge for students and adults and students can win tools to support their love for learning of what they're interested in in a STEM focused career. So I hope you can check it out. Some other things that I mentioned earlier, remember I said how AI is going to be impacting us as it already is now, but also futuristically, let's just say for our future generations that will be designing these mobile robots and interfaces of web technologies so that I, as a grandparent can stay home instead of having to go into a nursing home or even my own kids can be home to live uh, their later part of their lives. This site is called the curiositymachine.org. This is just a wonderful balance of blended approaches of design thinking challenges. Some are five minutes in length, so they're small snackable chunks. Others are 15 minutes and then they're up to an hour. But these AI challenges also empower your students with this, not necessarily a subject specific approach, but a multidisciplinary approach. So students are seeing how literacy, foreign language, social studies, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and so on fit together and work together in our world. So tap into these challenges. It's absolutely phenomenal. And then the best part of this, there's also a link that students work with parents at home. So this is such a great tool to support remote online teaching and learning that parents that really wanna be involved and help mentor and model their own children, this is a great place that they can do projects together and even supported with your curriculum of the, or the standards that you must cover when teaching teachers and or students. I have a wealth of resources here that I want to give to you. This is called the Engineering Derby Digital Toolkit. I co-wrote this with a brilliant team of women leaders. And these particular teachers are all master teachers that have a classroom that they work with teachers and students K through 12. So I've got an elementary section, a middle school section, a high school section, and also pre-service teacher section. Within this book, 
we have design challenges for you. And then also, if you choose a tool, let's say I use the three doodler pen, I want to create 3D structures using a pen. And how do I put that into place into my classroom for my littles, for my middle school kids or for my high school kids? Well, we've got teaching scenarios in that that is included. So please tap into this and it's free for yours to use and distribute. It was designed using Book Creator and bookcreator.com is one of those brilliant collaborative sites that you can digitize and create books or newsletters or even just individualized books that students can create to share and tell their STEM learning story. Okay, that was a lot, right? A lot of information in a little bit of time. But I want to know what's one new strategy that you will now try to utilize and connect with your students on a personalized level to discover their passion driven interest. What is something that you'll now try um, of all the ideas? If I go back, we, we've got a toolkit book. We've got the curiosity machine for AI and STEM challenges. We have instructables. I've got job task cards to really get your kids thinking futuristically about the possibilities of what they can dream to become. We've got mentoring sites. We've got the Sci Girls Connect. I mean, there's so much. So if you could focus on one or two at the most, what is it that you want to introduce to your students or teachers to make an impression for them to pursue something of their own STEM passions or their dreams? I know there's a lot, but sometimes if we focus on one or two, we'll be more in tune to try to use it. So I'm gonna pause just for a moment and then I'm going to bring up our back channel chat to see where you're at. Okay, wonderful. Mary Monique is going to be using the mentoring sites. Yeah, any time that you can use more mentoring and role modeling, that, that is when you look at the brain-based research. In order for students to be successful, and especially key, girls, after their middle school years, they need access and appropriate equity to resources of hands-on learning experiences, and they need mentoring and role models from male and female teachers. And they need the support from their parents and their grandparents. That's why it's so important. Yeah, the Curiosity Machine is a wonderful little gem. It really is and also design thinking tools. Absolutely. And I love it because there's small chunks of information at a given time. Yeah. yeah, the Passion to Purpose Project. Oh my goodness, I'm not kidding. I absolutely love it. My pre-service teachers and teachers that are taking my online graduate course right now, they're loving it because the, the endless possibilities of to dream up of creating a final product that they can create from a problem they're trying to solve, it, it really makes it very empathy filled and it's compassion based. That's why they're loving it. Okay, uh, Lori, you have to give me more information. It says great book, not free, design thinking tasks based on read alouds, making and tinkering and STEM solving problems. You may need to add that to the back channel chat in case I don't know what you're referring to. It, but it's just a it's the name of the book. Okay. And, and there's all these design challenges based on these read alouds that are very common in K five classrooms. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing and, and thank it's just, you for that's helping. the title of the book. It's not cheap, but it's you know not horrible. Okay, and as I mentioned that, here's one other that, oh my goodness, I should have put this in because I just received it. It's called um, Journey. I'm going to put this in the back channel set that is chat so you get it too. So Journey to City X, and I'm going to get the link for you. So let me bring it up. And it's $19.99 written by a teacher for teachers to empower students with being creators of their futures and the design challenges are absolutely mind blowing. I love it. I love it. I love it. So let me bring this back to you to get the right site for the teacher site. That I can provide this for you. I'm kind of almost kicking myself. I did put this in the presentation. Now that I've just said that I will now put this in, but I am going to add it here now for you so that you do have it. It's been one of the best investments that I have actually purchased in a long time. Um, I'm also using it for some of my STEM online learning projects with students and teachers that I'm co-teaching. So that is going to be the biggest bang for your buck. And yeah, Maria says, can I have a copy of your slide deck? Absolutely. I've got a few more things for you and I'm going to get you that link, Maria. So just hang on just a second. I'm glad that you asked me as a reminder. Thank you. 
So I want to give you a few more things. We're not quite done yet, but if, if you can't stay on, I understand there's a lot here. But we also need to outline the purpose of the why for computer science. And we need to connect the learning dots for students right now about how the computer science is the biggest differentiator to help bring in the wonderful learning experience background from all our di diversified generations of students right now. This is going to help us be more productive and more efficient moving forward and how we create and make these amazing products to support our world. So we already know computer science is helping us save lives. It's helping people. It's connecting all of us. Computer science is the backbone of everything from movies to video to online banking, doing many online transaction, transactions, which is helping us expedite what we do. Yet, did you know that computer science also is the foundation of creating those amazing microchips that are in our computers, that are in sensors, like so in Napa Valley, California, there's a microchip that actually knows how much to water the grapevines when it's too moist or it's too dry. It's a sensor chip and it needs the algorithm of the computer science to do that. Even in our men and women that have traumatic brain injuries and that's also causing an, an enormous amount of PTSD, they are futuristically actually going to be implanting a small chip behind the ear that will actually understand and help read the different types of neurons and the sensors in your brain to help formulate and bring back lost memories from long-term and short-term memory loss. I'm actually very much looking forward to that because my son suffered a severe traumatic brain injury six years ago. And the possibilities moving forward that computer science can help him gain those memories that he's lost. I mean, that to us as parents, that's everything. So I can't wait for that to come out. How about some of you that have grandparents or babies? The sensories that, that have been created. So look at the little onesies that fits on the side of their little tummy that now I can put a little granddaughter or grand, grandson to bed at night and that if I'm watching them knowing I'm in the next room, I can monitor their heart rate, their breathing pattern, their temperature, and to really monitor where they're at. So it's keeping me really connected to my grandchildren. Yet at the same time, it gives a sense of safety and urgency also for our, for our own children that are having their own families now. Some other things I mentioned already, you know, the robotic surgery, it's absolutely amazing. The medicine that's being evolved around computer science, it's helping to create artificial limbs for our children that are born without a limb, or if a limb has been lost in a, a war or an accident, that's what's the biggest game changer right now. Some of you already know this, but anytime that you can apply applied robotics and having it more physically based with kids, that's the game changer because not only are they building a creative algorithm, they're also putting applied technology technologies together in, in order to solve for a problem and create a final product of a solution. So other types that you can use, hands-on activities that are not anything related to technology, but are offering an unplugged reality for kids. I have used this, which is called hands-on coding. It helps our students chunk out small bits of information to create a learning story first. So I usually ground it in a big book or a chapter book that we're reading. And then from there, I use the hands-on coding blocks to help the students sequence and create an algorithm pattern to showcase their understanding of the sequencing of the story. Then from there, I have our own students create their own story of an algorithm pattern, and then they do a learning walkabout on the, on the floor, and then they code that path as a walkabout before we take them into Scratch Junior or Scratch to create their own types of learning coding paths. Some other things if you haven't seen, some of you may have not seen this. This is from a very ingenious woman from Wisconsin. These are called Meeper bots. Meeper bots include robotics and sensors and Legos, and they create dynamic cars. And I absolutely love it because of the different sensory modalities. And also because I'm very passionate to learn from another woman that had this idea to impact so many students. and. Um, 
this is a tool that if you haven't seen, I think you need to tap into because most of us have Legos of some capacity and most of us may have some different types of robotics, but knowing that we can now create the sensors, the robotics and the Legos together to create an ultimate solution. And this really focuses on like an autonomous uh, self-driving car solution and how do we automate things futuristically. So that's what I really like about this. Some other things I mentioned earlier, Makey Makeys. If you haven't tapped into this, this is a very creative solution. Here's Mr. John Kripko from the Q organization. I created him as a talking doll that was empathy-based to understand a story that he was telling. So basically, he gave me the right to take a picture off the internet, which I printed out, and then I created a little bib overall because he loves to cook barbecue. And so I made a little barbecue outfit for him. And then I hooked up my Makey Makey with brass fasteners onto the actual little doll cutout. And then when I created the code in Scratch, I can record my voice. And then at trigger points, when you touch to make the complete circuit, I had John tell his story. Now, of course, I'm a woman and John is a man and John had a deeper voice. So I first put it through a voice recorder that rendered out the voice to sound deeper and it came back and it played almost sounding like John. So I love that opportunity. But if you can have your students tell their st story through a talking doll technique, and by doing that, you can also have your students share their background learning experiences to build a stronger community of learners, that's the type of empathy-filled and empathy-based learning opportunities we should be providing our students. Other areas, I love robots of any sort, Ozobots and Spiros. It's great how even they've become so small, almost pocket size, but helping kids make the physical reality um, and combining it with a digital literacy component to helping them create ingenious, brilliant code. So again, grounding it in literacy, telling their story, then have the students apply the digital and applied robotics to replicate a new story to the to retell their ending or to design that story almost on the, on the floor or card that they can do it on the floor and then go through those walking steps as well. Other areas, if you haven't seen, Microsoft Make Code has got so many components that complements a lot of these physical robotics. So if you look at like Wonder Workshop, um, and they're known for makewonder.com, those are the uh, founders and creators of Dash and Dot. They also have the Q robot that you can do JavaScript programming that works with Make Code and works with even Windows devices or Chromebook devices or iPads. So any of these two, if you can use any type of circuitry or the micro bit, kids are actually creating new problem or creating new solutions to solve their problems that they're facing and they're creating an efficiency model and they're working together as a team and a strategist that's what's so fun about this so on this particular site that i've added there's so many different types of learning scenarios and design thinking challenges that last for five minutes or up to an hour so it's up to you what you want to use code.org again foundational skill sets love 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 I love the unplugged activities, I love the maker challenges, and I love that it's chunked out by pre-reader, grades two through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. So lots of opportunities here for you. And again, anything that you can put a, applied robotics into practice to match up the code for kids to create a dynamic algorithm to solve a problem, that's our focus of what we're trying to do. So Legos can do just that from you. And many of us have Legos that are around our homes or around our communities. Um, moving forward with the pandemic, I know we gotta be careful of what we share. So even individually giving students choice of activities to use and then appropriately cleaning them as well. Some other things I mentioned earlier, the microbit site has all kinds of challenges that can really be differentiated according to the level of um, confidence that your child or your teachers are used to and then moving forward to kick it up a notch. That's what I really like about this. So if you haven't tapped into the microbit challenges, 
this can truly be a game changer. And I will set this up that I'll do micro bits at one learning station. I will set up dash or dot or queue at another learning station. Then I will do unplugged building activities and literacy resources at another. So there's a, a brain based balance so that kids don't become so overwhelmed or teachers become overwhelmed. Some other things for the littles, especially I love play Osmo. Plays Osmo really infuses a lot of rich literacy, reading, writing, and creating experiences, but infuses the math, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So they have a whole coding platform as well too, but then they have all of these infused practices that match up with literacy focused and math and STEM enrichments. Again, I wanted to share with you, um, I lead a coding and makerspace playground every year back in the Midwest. And so this one took place in December. So I want to give this to you. So what we have is we had maker challenges set up as rotation stations and teachers came in from K through 12 and got to rotate at their choice, any type of station. And we had 12 different learning stations. So as you can see, we did 3D printing, we did uh, coding with dash and dot and B bots. We did a green screen and stop motion activity. We did makey makeys, we did micro bits, we did osmos and spheros, we did it all. But what was so nice about this is that teachers got to experience firsthand what it is, what you can do with it and how to get started for your classroom. Teachers built their own learning confidence by this exploration area and knowing that they felt better introducing it to students in the classroom. So again, just a few um, closing options here if you have a moment to reflect, but what is one new coding tool or resource that you would like to introduce to your students to excite their love for computer science? Please add that to the back channel chat, something new that you'd like, and I've got a few more things. Even though I know our hour is most up, I just have a few more shares with you. But we mentioned earlier those 3D printers, and this is the, all the rage right now. What can we create to help our workforce with more productivity in our K through 12 schools, but also our universities and then into the workforce. So if you haven't already, the Cricut, the Cricut makers are absolutely amazing. We're seeing all kinds of different screen printing technologies, new ways to represent yourselves on social shares, and then how students are creating even with this PPE uh, for our healthcare workers. 3D printers, if you haven't seen the large glow forges, the glow forge printers, they, they're kind of costly. They range from anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000, but they're tabletop printers that you can put in thin sheets of plywood, actually high end dark chocolate density strips can go in for 3D pastry makers. You can put in leather. You can even put in your own laptop that it will do a, a silk screening engraving on top of it. I saw these firsthand in Hawaii is where I first was exposed to these. And I tell you, it blew my mind away. <laughs> so it's amazing how kids are reinventing how to create everyday objects for your homes with these particular printers. Other printers, if you haven't seen, this is called the Three Doodler Pens. Um, Build a Better Book Giving Day really builds empathy if you, have, if you are a child or a teacher with an impairment and how to design and create um, from a different perspective to gain empathy with an individual that does have this impairment. I do have an ongoing, it's called a Three Doodler Global Engineering Design Challenge. You can take any step of it that you want and get to the next experience where you're at as well too. So once again, let me just bring that back for you, the 3D uh, printer design challenge. Our next area, if you're looking for augmented reality, we have some tips and tricks kind of where you're at with this. And many of you have seen this before. But augmented reality are basically live and interactive or indirect view of a physical real world environment. And that environment can pop out in front of you based on if you access a QR code or a triggered image using your mobile device that you have that app to read that particular sensor image. Now, if you haven't seen Quiver Vision, they also offer free coloring books to experience this. So we did one like um, the bird one that you can see there. So when we were learning about habitat and the different types of birds that were in Wisconsin, and every year around October, November, we have over 100,000 snow geese that land in Brownsville, Minnesota, where I originally used to be from. And in this area, it was the most beautiful site 
and they would take kids on field trips to the nature overlook that was a observation area to view these birds and talk about habitat. Well, before we got there, we actually had this activity that we printed out one of the birds and we had kids color them and then we used the Quiver Vision app that kids would hover over and then we'd have a more rich experience of talking about why do these birds land here? Why is it every year at this time frame that they migrate and they come to this particular area? So you can use augmented reality to truly interest your students with hands-on learning before they actually experience the nature effect with this too. So we wanted to blend the nature aspect with the background knowledge to educate our students on. Some other things, if you're looking for augmented reality, this is on brain space technologies and they have a magazine that comes out from Canada. And this one is called brain space and it's using, using the app called blipper and blipper will allow for you to hover over the magazine or the digital space and that 3D world will come out to you. And it experiences it in a new form and way of making that nature and that reality be experienced because if children can experience it based on where in the world they are from. Other things also, if you're looking for virtual reality resources, some of you are probably saying, gosh, we're just getting started or you haven't even started yet. This is also an area that can be, it's totally computer generated and it's a simulation of a three-dimensional image or environment that students and teachers can learn from. It's a physical way to interact um, in an environment that provides um, the, the right appropriate equipment for you to experience it with sensors. Now, if you want to create your own 3D environment, there's ways to do this. The Ryko Theta 360 camera, along with 360 cities, will allow for you as an individual to take pictures and or video clips that are 360. Then you can upload those pictures to 360cities.net. And then you can actually create interactive touch points of callouts to learn about a global experience that your students would have never had the opportunity to go and venture out to. This is a great way to really engage kids to broaden their perspective of what the entire world has to offer. And again, if you want to reflect on, you know, what was a new 3D printing or an AR or VR tool, please add that. Or if you've experienced this and had great success, please share with us in the back channel chat what you have today. We'd love to learn with you. The last part I have, again, I have so much for you because I want to give you the world, but there's so many kids that are really into video games and they say that they want to be a video game uh, creator and that is an actual job and we, and we need not to poo-poo that and those experiences with our kids because we need more video game creators to create those simulated 360 experiences to help empathize with learning better about our global world around us. So if you haven't tapped into, it's called the ALICE Project, and this is a simulization based on the research and also has extensions to the Hour of Code of the how and why video games actually can build an empathy-based and compassionate learning community. It's all enriched, too, when you think about how kids are creating Minecraft spaces and digital virtual environments. It's all based on basically a simulization and basing on a logic and sequencing model. But, but they're building it because students are learning together and teaching each other in a safe and an ethical platform. So there's a lot being done out there. The, my most recent study that I've seen is that a teacher friend share with me that even in Minecraft that it was created, that children created their own virtual art gallery and they showcased their own art. And then with that art, what they did is students came in and got to interact with it and can leave critical feedback and ask questions. So students created the virtual art gallery right within Minecraft. It was just mind blowing what kids are doing during this pandemic. Other game-based learning strategies, if you haven't seen, this is called Bloxel's Builder, one of my favorites by far, and it provides for us a gaming experience that's tangible first. So the game board that is black and has the colored pegs on, what that does for you is that you can create your own visual display board, and those pegs each have kind of like a superpower built into them. One can jump, one can go back, one can do a cartwheel, one can have superpowers, one can help us with empathy and strategize with logic. 
once you build that board, you take the app that you install in your mobile device and you hover over that board, it then becomes a 3D virtual game to play. And it is amazing of what the boys and girls that I've worked with at middle school and high school of how they love this. Even our upper elementary kids do a really good job with creating this logic simulated game and strategize. So as soon as they play it and then if something happens that, uh-oh, they fell, they didn't go far enough, they know right away, uh-oh, I have to persevere, I have to go back, I have to change, and I have to modify that. And from that, the kids learn right away uh, what is so successful for them. And then they can teach others how to use it. The last thing I wanted to share with you is if you're really into video games and experiences, this collection from Common Sense Media provides 27 game making tools for schools. And this provides for you different ways to gamify any of the things that we mentioned here today and take it to a whole nother level because kids are loving um, that competition, but even sometimes the competition is just amongst themselves. It doesn't have to be against another person, but they feel like they are basically leveling up their skill set. So tap into that resource. And those of you that joined us later, um, this is my contact information that I wanted to share with you and also the Microsoft PowerPoint slide deck that I wanted to share with you. It's saved at tinyurl.com slash Gen Z Tinker Code Make. So I want to make sure that you get that. I will click on this actually at this time and I'm going to link that again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop presenting because I've talked enough right at you, but I want to give you that back channel chat to that link again. But please feel free to come online and we can still talk and strategize about any topic any idea or any resource that we mentioned, or please share your own. I'd love to hear from you. There's Lori. Hello, Lori. So please share with us at this time. So Diana, I'm glad, I, I hope, I know I gave you so much this time and I talk so much, but these are all the things I've been implementing in my last three years with STEM that are really taking off, that I've worked with kids personally and teacher leaders that are really super excited. Okay, Lori, do you have anything that I'd love I just to hear think from it's you? It's a little bit hard for some of this with the um, if we're going back full distance learning, right? Mm -hmm. Because robots and all that kind of stuff, I can't get my kids, every student, one of these to take home. And so um, I think um, micro bits, they got that, uh, or make code, they have that simulator. So they can right. do it without the micro bit. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to do that, it's not quite as impactful i guess but you could prepare kids for it um so i think that's that's a struggle right now mm -hmm. is i mean obviously you can do code.org the kids can do that at home um i would suggest that if you're going to do coding and stuff do some screencasts ahead of time okay of the teacher like i would as a teacher i want to do scratch with my students and i i've done it with some of them already so I think they know the basics, but I'm going to do some screencasts of me doing certain things so that they have that to refer to. Um, and then there's um, CS First, where they have the videos. But yep. I think a lot of this stuff is, is so awesome. I've been working in Makerspace, so obviously I love it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just doing it remotely is really hard. That's why I wanted to put that book in there, because it's read-alouds, right? And mm -hmm. so I did the read-alouds, and I basically um, screencast a Kindle book and read and then I said the design challenge at the end and the kids in Seesaw would like build a build a chair for baby bear, right? Based on Goldilocks. Right. And then they had to build a sturdy chair and then have all these pictures of kids like, and then I had to teach them, how can you make, um, put cardboard together without tape? Cause I'm in a low income district and the kids didn't have supplies. So I had to figure out at home how to make these things with no tape. Yeah. And then, so I showed them some uh. techniques to do that. And then they made their chairs and I got pictures with the water bottle on the chair or an apple or some potatoes showing that the chair was sturdy. So they made stuff at home. It's not tech, but it was a way to get that making in the home right. piece. Um, and that design and thinking the strategy. ELA. Yes, the EL is. Well, and the design thinking strategy. That's exactly right. But the kids need to be tinkering, making, creating. They need to be failing and saying, oh, this didn't work. Let's try this now, right? So that, that's another good thing. 
What also what I heard from you, Lori, you talked about the simulator, right? There's another simulator for um, Dash Robotics. If you haven't seen the oh, virtual. Is. Yes, there is. You know what? I'll have to bring up that link too. Because I have a Dash um, robot and I've used those with my students a lot. Right. So let me, um, I got to remember the Dash robot. Make sure. And here is, let's see if we can bring it up. And this is a this is a reseller for them that's giving the overview of how to use this. So let me make sure I add this in here. So this is the Dash Robot Simulator, because that's they purposely created this due to the pandemic, knowing that kids were not getting the robots at home. I think there's got to be a better way. Like some school districts, when they realized that they were they weren't coming back, that they actually had all of a sudden a drive up day that parents or guardian would come to pick up a laptop. I think there's got to be a better way that we've got to have almost another drive up day if you're not going back to school face to face yet. Um, that if we can do it a certain way that we can rotate some robotics to some of our kids, we've got to think differently. I do I, have some parents too that actually said that they would actually purchase, they'd love to purchase them and have yeah, that environment. People in my district can't do that. But I was thinking okay. donors choose for micro bits. I could, you could get a class set for like 600, between yeah. 600 and $700, you could get 30 or 40. I think I got 40 uh, for Makerspace. So they wouldn't have to share them. Um, right. I think the problem even with the drive up thing is then you have to sanitize. I mean, then you have to sanitize everything. Yeah, everything's going to be, it's, it's kind of like back in the day, how we had to check a book out, bring it back to the library. And in, in, in our libraries, they've always had to sanitize. We're kind of going back to that model again. So Quite a few um, people came up with um, virtual robotic stuff over the summer that I kind of looked at. Um, at that time, I thought I was going to be teaching middle school and now I'm teaching fourth grade. I think some of it's a little bit much for fourth graders without more instruction ahead of time. But um, yeah, there was, there's, um, a bunch of stuff out there um, so that's but it, it, it is hard it's hard to do yeah. it with without the in-person part at least to start so CS first I thought was really good um, I use that yes yes it is very good uh, and you can get that videos mm -hmm. yeah it's free and the videos so you can have the kids watch the videos you just have to explain slow it down and certain things and how to flip back and forth but they can kind of work on that too depends on your students and their prior knowledge i guess yep absolutely absolutely well i'd like to continue to learn from all of you you know moving forward and i think what we really need to do is identify what does it look like during our pandemic and how uh, meaning that how do we provide these experiences for our children when they don't have the right tools at home because even though you're at your school how do we get them to provide that same type of learning experience in the home. So I think more strategies around that. So moving forward, I'm gonna look at probably creating and making some presentations on that, but I will be reaching out to you because I know that you're using best practices and your ideas, Lori, and the others that have also shared in the back channel chat, it's amazing what you're doing. We, we are really reinventing education as we know it right now, we are. I know, I know it's kind of a, a big headache, but at the same time, Futuristically, something else is going to happen besides the pandemic, and we could be in the same predicament again. But learning from where we're at to help us be more proactive, to be prepared, I think is, is what's going to have to help us futuristically. Right. Okay. Um, Javier also said, yes, start small with Legos. I also agree. There are so many great challenges that are out there, like even the six brick challenge. That alone really, when you just give six bricks to kids and you ask them to build a duck in one minute, it's amazing all the different ducks that they can create and everyone is different. So it really puts kids to, in perspective of how they perceive spatial reasoning, how they design, and how kids create and make so differently. Yes, absolutely. And Lego education has got such a wonderful foundation of new educational lessons and activities. Not only does it have the Legos, it's totally based on social emotional learning. And that's what I love about it. And they do have a very big research study out on the importance of play. So with all of this, it should be allowing kids to play, to tinker, to create and make. And they should have more time to process.
I even felt like I'm just rambling. I'm trying to give you as much as I can today. At the same time, we need to slow down. But pick and choose just one thing from this presentation and uh, just run with it and make it the best it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, teacher friends, that you have at this time? I hope I did not miss anything from the back channel chat. Okay, and I'm hoping I introduced a few new tools that maybe you have not seen before or extended resources to enrich what you already know. Okay. Okay, thanks everybody for sharing. I greatly appreciate it. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you everybody. I'm going to stop the recording at this time, and this recording will be available within about 48 hours from our live session today, and it can be found at q.org slash Microsoft, and you can go back and uh, go back to the original session and then learn again and go back and look at the chat that others had shared some great learning connections. So thanks so much for all you do, and thanks once again to the Q organization from California and also Microsoft for this wonderful partnership that we can afford to bring all of these sessions to you free and that we can learn together. Because my biggest focus is too is that there's no way we can know it all, but when we learn together, we can be better to help each other moving forward with, these, with this current pandemic that we're in. So thanks everyone, have a great week.